Welcome to the Chicago Money Show. I'm Bridget Sullivan Mermel. When a viewer wrote in and asked about some questions about long-term care insurance, I thought, I've got just the guest. Her name is Miriam Whiteley. I'm so excited to have her on the show. I think we can work on debunking the myth that getting older is full of misery. The stats that I see are that people get happier and happier as they get older. And then around 80, if you play your cards right, thing, something different can kick in, a feeling of resonance and meaning. We both want to have you uh, understand the planning and a little bit of thought you can do now, wherever you're at in your journey, to make sure you make the most out of your entire life, including uh, as you get older. So welcome, Miriam. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Great. Well, so you call it long life planning. So why don't you tell us, uh, tell our audience about long life planning and how it really helps us maximize our money, meaning, and happiness? It's exactly what you just said in your opening, Bridget. It's the, the opportunity in long life planning is to make the most out of our lives and a lot of times people get toward the end and they've had this idea that they're accumulating for something. And then they get there and there can be a real sense that, what did I work so hard for? What, what am I getting out of this time now? Mm -hmm. And that's because a lot of people have focused on the money accumulation and they realize, you know, the same studies that say people get happier, those people are the ones who have people. They have a social life, they have connections, they've maintained that. And some people have traded that off. They've accumulated the money, but not invested in those relationships. So long life planning is broadening the conversation from long-term care, or sometimes it's called elder care, which often focuses on things like where, you know, professional care, do what if I need housing um, changes? What if I need somebody to come in and help me with some activities, hygiene, food, that sort of thing. That, those are all incredibly important. And if we've dealt with parents or loved ones who've needed that kind of support, it's, it's complicated and difficult and you need to plan for it. But there's also this much bigger conversation about meaning mm -hmm. and how to extend our lives so that we live long and die short. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of opportunity to prepare for that. Um, if we think about it and we make it part of the conversation. That's so interesting. So you also talk about the two sides of money. And I think that roughly maps to your left brain and your right brain. And you've got a visual that I think describes it really well. Tell me about how this ties in with the two sides of money. It ties in because the two sides of money, in some ways, it's so interesting. You look at that left and right brain because some people talk about those two sides of our brain as being one, the the map, and the other is walking the trail. Hmm. And those are very different experiences, right? There's the overview and then there's the specifics. So if I translate that to the two sides of money, the specifics really are what people often ask. Do I have enough money? Have I saved enough? What will long-term care cost? Um, what are my taxes? How to optimize those? How should I invest when I start depleting my resources rather than contributing to those accounts. And those are all incredibly important. You need an expert to help you with the technical side. Mm -hmm. That's walking the trail. But then there's this, you know, what I call it is the view from the balcony. There's a lot going on. And then you need to take a step back and look at what are the relationships I want to maintain? What are the things I'm yearning to do? What, how do I feel about myself? A lot of people have shame and anxiety and those stressors we know really well now do not help us live long and die short. Those stressors are real contributors to people having chronic health conditions. Hmm. And, and we know that 60% of people have one chronic health condition, even more, you know, it, uh, and sorry, about a third have two. And those are the things that get people where they, you know, Andy Rooney says, we all want to live longer, but nobody wants to get old. Mm. That's the thing that we're really focusing on is to have that beautiful resonance that you talked about in your 80s. You need to feel well. You mm. need to feel good. You need to be able to do the things you have saved up to do. And so those getting people in touch with the human side of money, the feelings, the decisions, the, the thing about this that's so important is it's really the human side we make the decisions from. Mm. They are really what motivates us. 
Mm-hmm. So in order to get to that place, we want all of our clients to be at where they are free from financial stress and worry. It is really preparing with the fusion of those matching what do they yearn to do? What do they want? What's the money for with all of those technical things? Mm-hmm. It's the bringing them together and having a real plan that that has your strategies express your deepest desires, what I call what's at your heart's core. Yeah, that's so interesting. So another thing that I, I'm hearing when you're talking about this is that thinking about it early. So we've got another slide and it's like about working when you're younger to optimize your health when you're younger because that's what's going to carry in a lot of uh, because we're financial planners we think about your finances a lot but this really focuses on no what about your just your physical and emotional health i think that's one of the things that you just brought up that i thought was so interesting it's not just our physical health okay that's one thing but our emotional health too is important and so if we um straighten it out while we're uh in in this time like so that we're not we get along with people okay and we you know get the counseling or help we need if we're not and figure out how to manage our own stress that's what it sounds like you're proposing. Yeah, exactly. And the the thing about that 40 to 60 window is it's often when people really contribute mightily to their retirement accounts, to their savings, they buy up in their home. And it also is when people often are watching their health decline. Mm. They can't get up off the floor. They They are losing stamina. They're losing muscle mass. They're not sleeping well. And, you know, health is wealth. If you save all that money and you get to retirement and you can't go travel or you can't play golf or you can't run with your grandkids, most people aren't able to express the things that mattered the most to them. Mm -hmm. So it's really keeping those two things in check, exactly as you just said. Yeah, that's very interesting. So let's get into more about talking about your family. So let's say you're a parent and you want to broach the conversation with your kids about this is what my plans are. This is what I've thought about. Can you do you have any stories about how it's worked well? It can work well. And it's really important for people first to just recognize what some of the obstacles are. And one of the ways to deal with this is for people to really start exploring what is it that they would be able to get if they have these conversations with their Mm. children. And a lot of times the obstacle is people are feeling like, if I bring this up with my adult children, I'm going to be burdening them with Mm. something because what we're really talking about is my mortality. And that will be difficult for them. That will give them Um, That will introduce a subject that then is dark and hard to deal with. It's uncomfortable. And the thing that I really encourage people to realize is that if you really take up, what are the experiences I want to have down the road when I'm older? What kinds of things do I want to be doing? What are the conversations I want to be having? How do I want to be spending my time? How do I want to be spending my money? And then you you realize that it is much more possible. You know, all of life is uncertain. We don't know what we're, we're planning into an uncertain future when we get to this subject. Mm -hmm. And, and the thing about preparing is you will have given the best gift your loved ones want, which is knowing what are your wishes? What would Mm -hmm. you want to have happen? So if you can't talk for yourself, they know where your important documents are, Mm -hmm. or they know what you wanted in terms of your, you know, with advanced directives and having a healthcare advocate, they know how you, what kind of care you wanted to receive. All of those conversations seem like they can be a burden when they actually happen. My experience with clients is it gives the adult children such a sense of relief. Right. So, you know, one time I met with, uh, I, that what's coming to mind is a family that had three children and we all met and we looked at their money and what they had. And it was very illuminating for their children to see how proactive and thoughtful their parents had been. And it really helped them reflect on, oh, I've got some work to do for myself. Mm. You know, if I started now to get these things in order, know where the important documents are, have make sure your my spouse knows the passwords. You know, the what if I get hit by a bus thing mm-hmm. really comes forward when somebody else shares. We want you to know these are our plans. These are the experiences we want to have. And then they do things like 
have that weekly, that week, that summer vacation that they want so desperately to have. Once you've really expressed, this is what I really want, what really matters to me, what the money is for, hmm. loved ones really often respond with stepping in to make that possible. Interesting. But when it exists in a vacuum, it's yeah. much harder to make it happen. That's so interesting. Okay. And we've got uh, just a few more minutes before the break. Uh, what about kids broaching the subject with parents? Like, so I see a lot of kids that are children. They're, they have their parents are, they're older people. They're in their thirties, forties, fifties. Uh, and their parents are still alive, but they want to get moved through this phase of my parents seem okay. They're not asking me for money. They seem okay. I don't, I think they're okay, but I don't know for sure. And that's kind of stressing me out because I don't know what we do if something comes up. And I like to say there's kind of two, two ways you can do this. There's the planning mode or the crisis mode. And so people want to avoid the crisis mode by just getting some information, yet a lot of parents don't want to talk about it because that implies that they're going to die. So, uh, you know, some of the things that we're getting at around here are just like people afraid of death and not being able to, uh, that that puts that part of the brain in some sort of mental lock. So they can't even entertain these other questions. So anyway, what do you talk, give me some examples of how you, um, you've seen with people, with kids bring, broaching it with their parents. Yep. And, that's the that brain that locks, that's the human side that really hasn't had the opportunity to surface some of those yearnings, some of those shames, some of those regrets, whatever they are. And a lot of times adult children are really reluctant to bring it up because they're afraid that their parents might hear it as, I want your money, <laughs> or I want to hasten your demise, or I just don't want to be burdened by you. So, you know, the, it can be very complicated when somebody, and the thing you didn't mention is, when you are beginning to to suspect some cognitive decline mm. and you're worried oh, that your parents fits. are not in the right place, maybe their neighborhood isn't walkable or you feel like it's not as safe as it needs to be and they're maybe okay now, but they won't be later or, or they've got big stairs to climb or rugs in their house it, or all It can all those be driving so too. It, you the, can be, you know, it can being be Being able to have, pick the right time, mm. own your own stuff. So, you know, Karen Wilson is someone who started assisted living in Portland. She was the one who came up with the idea of that kind of living community. And she says, what we want for ourselves is independence. What we want for our loved ones is safety. Oh, yeah, it's interesting. Just to first really honor that tension that, that what adult children often want is I just want my mom and dad to be safe. Right. And I, and, to be have dignity, what often the older person wants is independence. Yeah. And you want to know so, they're safe. So navigating. Yeah. Yeah, I think you want to and know just, that. And, yeah. and making it very above board that that what I want is to be able to have you have the best long life possible. Mm -hmm. So as you see yourself down the road, you know, what are the sorts of things that might trigger a change in your housing? What are the challenges that you see? What resources or alternatives might we consider? Awesome. So let's take a break here. Um, stay tuned for more Chicago Money Show with our guest, Myri Miriam Whiteley. Do you want to know what makes Chicago great at eight? Well, it's having your say, of course. For more than 15 years, having your say has brought you behind the scenes coverage of Chicago's movers and shakers. So make sure you tune in to Can TV 19 this week and every week for having your say and more exciting Chicago programs. Welcome back. We're here with Miriam Whiteley talking about long life planning. I'm going to ask her about some more specifics. So besides health, there's also the question of where are you going to live, right? And so I love, you've brought in another um, slide, which I really love because I'm kind of an XY kind of gal. And so why don't you talk about that slide? And specifically, first thing I want to make sure you do is to find the CCRC. That sounds like, I don't know if I want that. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> sounds like a disease. Huh? Yeah, exactly. A CCRC yeah. is a continuous care retirement community. Oh, so that sounds good. And yeah. <laughs> this slide that people are looking at shows on the Y axis, the cost that, that grows. You can see the CCRC is at the top, those are expensive. Along the x-axis is 
what level of care you're getting. So you can be, you know, down on the bottom left, you can have some level of care, but it's minimal and it doesn't cost very much. And that's what many people are doing in our country right. is providing care at home to their loved ones. Mm-hmm. So a CCRC means that there are all levels of care. You can be independently living, you can go to assisted living, they even have skilled nursing facilities, some have memory care facilities. So, you know, one of the questions that often comes up is about long-term care insurance. And when you buy into a CCRC, one of the very big advantages is then you're there, that fee has brought you all of those services. So I'm familiar with those intimately because my mom lived in one. Hmm. And when she had that sort of frequent flyer experience, and this is not uncommon if you have that disease trajectory where you are not living long and dying short, but you're living long and then you've got this long long. period of time Mm -hmm. where your health is not great. So she would need, you know, she would have an acute experience and then she would need a high level of care so she could go to the skilled nursing facility, go back to the sort of rehab level, then go back to her apartment, go back and forth. So those are terrific. You usually have a buy-in fee. Sometimes you can get it back if you you know, after a period of time, the contracts differ in different places. So that's one opportunity. But the thing I love about this slide, Bridget, is that a lot of people don't realize how many options there are. Exactly. You know, if you've got a loved one who's got cognitive decline, that can be, you know, the one of the great books about being a caregiver is called the 36 hour day. Hmm. And that's because it can feel like every 24 days, 36, it's exhausting. Right. And speaking of health, caregivers health really diminishes. So, you know, there are things like going to adult daycare, there are opportunities to have people come into your home for various levels of services. So it just, it gives people the spectrum of possibility. Right. Um, and, and that's what you need to be thinking about is, would I want to be at home, but maybe go somewhere else or have somebody come in to help care for me? Mm-hmm. Would I rather go be where I can be much more social with people, perhaps live independently and then move into assisted living if I need it? Mm-hmm. Um it's it's really important for people to realize that it's not just a black and white option, which sometimes if we don't know alternatives, that's why they're, that alternative part is so important. Mm-hmm. What you know, what if we found some places in our, you know, to look at in our town, not when you need it now. Right. This is that crisis versus preparation. Mm-hmm. But just to know exist if you would want to make a change. Yeah. And then you've got a list so that if you do have a health crisis, somebody else can. Oh, here's places and this person's opinion, you know, my loved one's opinions about it. So that it's not like a panic mode. There's enough, when someone has a health crisis, there's enough emotions to deal with without trying to um, deal with other planning issues like about moving, you know, and it, just about picking a place. So I really, when people are like around 70, I generally tell clients, okay, start thinking about this. Like, what are your preferences? And maybe you write them down. And then if, you know, try to figure it out a little bit early. Because I had one client and they were 85 and they were moving from their single family house. And they moved to a CCRC. And it was, you know, moving's not easy when you're 20. It's definitely not easy when you're 85, you know, and forced to do it because of like declining health. They were still okay, but they had declining health. And so they're trying to negotiate with their neighbors about buying their house. And, you know, it's just like, this is a lot. This would be, a, you know, this is a lot to deal with. And then move is dealing with other stuff. So I just I wanted to put that out there that it's a great idea to start thinking about it a little bit, not you don't have to do anything, but just start thinking about it and open your mind to it when you're 70 and then think, OK, what you know, how how is this going to play out? And I've spent a lot of time talking to older folks and and what I hear from them is they wished they had made the move sooner, mm-hmm. because when you are in your 70s now, this is a broad brush. It's not true for everybody at every age, but there there begins to um there is a real that resonance that excitement that being in life that still wanting to make new friends make new connections later on if especially if you're doing it in response to a crisis Mm -hmm. you typically don't feel as good you don't have as much energy you don't make those connections and what people clearly need is the social connection later Mm -hmm. um and you know we were talking about adult children before if you know that your parent has done some of that preparation and that thinking there is less of this feeling that you need to swoop in and save a situation that's falling apart. 
you just are more picking up and carrying it with your parent. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity for it to be much more of a shared adventure as opposed to a sort of rescue operation. Right, right, right. Yeah. So let's go back to uh, long-term care insurance. Let's uh, talk about what you tell people to look for. Like, who do you think are good candidates to even think about it? And then how do you talk, how, how do you approach picking something out? That's a really great, great question. And typically speaking, they get very expensive if you're much older than your mid fifties. Mm -hmm. And if you have enough resources to self-insure, that's often, you know, so there's sort of a tipping point. Yeah. Know? What's, a, yeah. what's enough? What what's do you tell enough? people is enough? Yeah. Um, you know, I have heard different things. The, one of the things that's really true about this is it really depends on where you live. How expensive it all well, is. And what's your, but I think exactly. if people have, you know, $2 million in savings, they are in a situation where they probably don't need mm -hmm. long term care insurance. And if they have, you know, under $500,000, the premiums are probably going to be really costly, mm -hmm. depending on what other, you know, in terms of proportion to their spending. In between there, where do you live? What kind of health situation are you looking at? What mm -hmm. are your own individual factors? Um, and what experience do you want to have? How much care do you want to have? The, the really interesting thing is that long-term care insurance, while it has undergone massive changes, there are some real options. You know, it is a lot like car insurance. It's the insurance you don't want to have to use. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't want to get in the accident. You don't. And if people just hate the idea that they've paid all this money and premiums for something they'll never use, the, the insurance industry has come up with some interesting options. So I have a client who looked at her annuity, really decided maybe as an income stream, she wasn't going to need that. We converted it into a long-term care insurance policy instead. Hmm. Or you can get hybrid policies where they, if you don't end up using them, they can become life insurance and to a beneficiary. So I really encourage people to look at the options. They're different from they were before, but the reality is they're very expensive. They're expensive and uh, they also don't cover everything and generally have a lifetime maximum. So it, I think the idea about them is that I'll be taken care of. I don't have to anything to worry about then. And actually, the reality, what I see more often is that they can be hard to use because you have to be pretty sick to be able to use them. Exactly. And they don't last forever either. So um, so that's, again, there's this conception that they last forever and they actually don't. They're usually, they have maximums. But the other thing I've seen is that even inexpensive policies can chip in and be helpful. And it's like, so for instance, I had one uh, client that had a, a policy through AARP that was actually not expensive, but it did kick in and help her with some in-home care uh, when she was, she again, she qualified. So she was minus two acts of daily living, which are like getting out of bed and going to the bathroom, you know, so basic things that she couldn't do. Uh, and it was, it wasn't like, you're all okay, there's no problems, but it was like, no, this chips in. And it was available for in-home care. I think at most times now, the policies I've seen both cover if you're in a nursing home or if you're in home. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Now we want to go on our lightning round of who are these people. So these are people that can help you. Uh, so one or two sentences on each of these types of people and who they are and why they might help. First, daily money manager. Daily money manager is terrific if your mom or dad or you are having trouble with daily, you know, financial management tasks, paying bills, keeping on top of things. If especially this is where people get vulnerable to scams um, and abuse, so they help pay the bills, do those sorts of things. Okay, geriatric care manager. They are the quarterback of your care team. So calling in an independent geriatric care manager when. You or your, you know, especially if you've got a mom or dad and you need somebody to oversee what's happening in the hospital, what's happening at home, they can get you a hospital bed at home. They can figure out if you're getting the right tests or if you need to move to a different community. Senior move manager. This deals specifically with the thing you were talking about. You encourage your clients to go look around in their communities, um, what options are. Daily, senior move managers can come to your house interview you, see what your house is like, what your needs might be, do some basic assessments, and then fit you to the right communities in your area. They're invaluable. And concierge services. So that's, again, so helpful, especially for adult children who are dealing with an acute situation. 
they can walk you through Great. What, okay. what your parent needs. So Miriam Whiteley, thank you so much for joining me today. If people want to find out more about you, how should they go about that? So my company name is Lifecraft, one word, financial planning. My website is www.lifecraftfp.com. You can also email me at info at lifecraftfp. And you've got a newsletter too, which is terrific. So uh, I've got a newsletter. If you want to sign up for that, go ahead and get on very that. Good. Get info me. My name is Bridget Sullivan Mermel. You can find out about my family financial planning firm at www.sullivanmermel.com. Check out this show's website at chicagomoneyshow.com. Sign up for a newsletter so that you can get a heads up before sh- upcoming shows. And today's topic was suggested by a viewer. So please keep your suggestions coming. Just email at us at ask at chicagomoneyshow.com. Thanks for watching. 